If you got a Bible, turn to Jonah chapter 1. And uh, glad to be here this morning. I hope you're glad to be here too. And uh, we are uh, in our study of the book of Jonah. And this morning is our second message. And so my plan is to have three more messages in Jonah. And then we're going to have a Vision Sunday on September 12th. And then after that, we're going to do a series in the family. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about marriage, talk a little bit about raising kids, and talk a little bit about um, just how the Lord has ordained families. And so that's kind of where we're going in the next uh, several weeks. And, um, but currently, we're in our second message, and uh, we learned a couple things about Jonah last week. Um, Jonah's in the Old Testament, which was the Old Covenant, and uh, Jonah was what we call a minor prophet. And he was a minor prophet, not because of his impact, but because of the length of his book. Um, Jonah's only four chapters long. And so as Jonah, uh, compared to Isaiah, or compared to Ezekiel, um, obviously it's a lot shorter. So they classify that as a minor prophet. Jonah himself would have been in the era of Jeroboam. And so in the Old Testament, you know, we have the historical books, but then we have the poetical books, and then we have the prophetical books. And in the prophetical books, is uh, that time frame happened in the historical books, but when you read the Old Testament, a lot of people think it's just chronological when it's not. Uh, the prophets actually are not chronological, they happen in the historical times, and in the historical times, the king was King Jeroboam II. And Jonah's name meant the dove. If you read through the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets were fire and brimstone. God sent them to tell Israel they were going to be wiped out or something was going to happen to them. But, but Jonah was much different. Jonah was a comforting message. God sent Jonah like a dove to um, calm the hearts of the Israelites, to calm the hearts of Israel. And so uh, as, as Jonah began to prophesy, um, Jonah as well, um, last week we talked a little bit about him being the son of the widow Zarephath, and uh, I, I'm, I didn't know if I made it clear enough or not, it's not in the Bible that he was, um, it's a historical record that some believe he was and some believe that he wasn't. And I told you the story of Elijah and the story of the widow um, but some say it happened, some say it couldn't have happened because of the timeline, and um, that is uh, sometimes easily misunderstood because in the Bible, the genealogy and the records is very accurate and historical um, pertaining to the bloodline of Jesus Christ. That's where the Bible really zeroes in on. Now, everything outside of that, it really doesn't get into much detail. Because the Bible was written for a purpose. The purpose of the Bible and through the Old Testament was to show us the clear line um, to the Messiah, which was Jesus Christ. And you can see that from Mary's side. And then when you get to Matthew, it gets cool because it shows you Joseph's side too. And although Joseph was just the earthly father, um, it's still on both sides. Um, the lineage goes all the way back to the Messiah through the Old Testament. So if Jonah was the son of Zarephath, okay. If he wasn't, he's okay. It's okay too, right? It really doesn't matter. And um, as we settled and talked about Jonah, uh, it was, he's a real person with a real story. Some of you may have heard, it's just a fairy tale. It's just a parable. It's just a story that people handed down. Um, it's maybe a story like my dad. My kids call him Poppy, and he, they come home with these stories, and I say, where in the world did you ever hear that story at? And it's just a poppy story. But this is not just a poppy story. This is a real story of a real person that happened to him. And this is not a fiction book. This is not a fairy tale. This was ordained by God and the Holy Spirit to be put in our 66 books for us to use it, apply it, and learn from it. And so that's what we're trying to do. As we embark on this journey, I challenged you last week... Um, very weakly, <laughs> by the way, uh, about answering the question, am I uh, completely and totally surrendered to God? Because when you read Jonah, we're going to learn a lesson. And the lesson that we learn from Jonah, hopefully, we won't have to learn in our own life. 
uh, I know this sounds like a buzz phrase, and I know we talk about it in Christianity, but I really want to, in this series, dig a little deeper. I want you to evaluate your heart. I want you to evaluate your walk with Christ and answer the question, am I completely, meaning that my whole heart, there's not one dark corner of my heart to where I push God away. That I, I'm allowing God to have every part of my heart. And then totally that whatever God wants me to do, I am willing to be surrendered to tell him I'm committed. Now when you get to the point to where you're willing to commit to God before he even tells you what you want to do, that's where God wants you. God wants you to be willing to say, have my whole heart and whatever you ask me or whatever you call me to do, I am completely surrendered to do that. And Jonah chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Hopefully you have a Bible, you can turn there or turn it on and get to the point. But here's what the first three verses says. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. And he paid a fear and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. For you note takers, point number one, the call of God. All right, the call of God. Now, when we read this, the word, obviously, in the very beginning says, the word came to Jonah. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It was a call from God. God called Jonah to go to a city called Nineveh. And in Nineveh was a wicked city. And in that city, God had called Jonah to go give them a message. And as God called Jonah, one of his prophets, he wanted to send the word to him. And that's the way God operates. God doesn't operate any other way than using his people. He accomplishes his will on this earth by calling his children to do a work for him. As servants of the Lord. See, God is the master and we are the servants. We are children of God, but we are also servants of God. God is the master, we are the servant. Jonah was the servant, and God had a message for Jonah to tell, and Jonah's job was to deliver the message to the Nineveh, to the Ninevites. And for us as Christians, it's a great thing for us to remember, have we realized that God is the master and we are the servant? Because I'm going to tell you, in your life, until you figure this out, that God has a will to accomplish, and he has an agenda to be done, and to be done, and he uses children of God to serve him. And for you and for me, God expects us to obey the call of God in our life. That when God calls us to do something, it's not optional. It's not like we can do it or we can't do it. In my home, I have two teenagers and I have a daughter who's going to be 12, but she's already past the teenage years. Um, I told her to hurry up, get out, and get married because you know everything right now. This would be a perfect time for you to embark into the world because you know everything. And uh, I'm glad she's not here this morning. She'd be crying. The difference between boys and girls, they would just get mad at me. She gets mad at me and pouts for about three days. But anyhow, she, you know, they, as kids, when I tell them to do something, it's not optional. And so I'll tell them, here's what you need to do. And when they don't do it, I have to reinforce it to make sure they do it. And a lot of times that may be uh, any type of punishment. The biggest thing that speaks their language when you take their phone from them. And then all of a sudden it gets, hey, I really didn't hear you say that, Dad, which <laughs> is not true. But God is the same way. He has a purpose and a call for your life. And when he calls us to do something, it's not optional. It's not for you and me to tell God what you want to do. It's God tells you what to do, and you're the servant, and we must do it. And for us as Christians, I think a lot of times we think, well, I'm saved, and I'm just going to come to church, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to soak, and I'm going to sour, right? That's what happens. And we become pew sitters, and we sit, and we never do nothing for God. We never serve the Lord, and he has a calling for our life. 
You say, well, Pastor Ted, you're a little off base because I wasn't called to be a pastor like you. I wasn't called to be an evangelist. I wasn't called to be a singer. Well, that's wrong. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you read your Bible, it doesn't matter what you are. It matters whose you are. And if you are a child of God, you are called by God. You might not be called to be a pastor, but you are certainly called to be a servant of God. I was called to be a pastor 13 years ago. But long before that, I was a servant of God. I served God from the day that I got saved. And the same way with you, there's a calling for your life. And just like Jonah, and just like me, and just like every single born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have a mission. And the mission comes from God, and as He calls us, He has a purpose for your life. Now, not only is that a challenge, and not only is that something we need to respond to, but what a blessing. It's a blessing for me to know that I was put on this earth not just to be a tile man, not just to tile showers, or not just to have a job, or not just to be a teacher, or not just to be a something. Most of you know um, that I am a Florida Gator fan, but if I had to like one thing about the Seminoles, I might need to take, wash my mouth out real quick. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> it, it was Bobby Bowden. Now, Bobby Bowden transcended football. Do you know why? He said it before he died. Even this morning, I was reading a quote. He said that far before being a coach, I am a servant of God. And whatever I've done in my life, I've always been a servant of the Lord. And he said, whatever God has for me, I'm ready to go. I have, I have finished my course. And man, what a perspective. I mean, in our life, we're not just who you are at your work. You're not just who you do, what you are on this earth. But we have the privilege to know that we have a purpose from God. And that he calls us to do it. And unfortunately, many of us treat the call of God like a telemarketer. You know, your phone rings and it's from out of state and you say, ah, I'm not answering that. But then your phone rings and it's like one of your neighbor's numbers. You know, like, like a local number. You say, wow, okay, hello. I've been trying to reach you for your car warranty, sir. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> they always ask me, do you still have a 2014 Chevy pickup? I said, no, I have a 1986 Cadillac Fleetwood. Do you have a warranty for that? All of a sudden, it's just like, bzz, nothing. But it, as we get a call from God, many times, we're like that. We treat God like a telemarketer. Oh, God, you want me to witness to my neighbor? Huh, bzz, sorry. Oh, God, you want me to serve at church on Wednesday nights with the kids? Oh, sorry, I'm tired on Wednesday nights. Oh, God, you want me to serve the Lord and serve on Sunday, but I don't want to get up that early. I like to get, come there, and I love the Krispy Kreme donuts, and I love the coffee, but I don't want to serve. Listen, God is not a telemarketer. God is not someone we could ignore. He has a purpose and a meaning and a calling on our life, and when we surrender to that, and we answer God before we even communicate, when we say, God, I am totally surrendered to you, let me tell you, if you go through this week and you open your heart and you say, God, you call me and I will do whatever you call me to do. Get ready because he has a purpose for you and he has a call for you. And Jonah had a call, but we're going to see what happens here in point number three. But for you note takers, point number two is the character of God. So we have the call of God, but we have the character of God. I don't know about you, but when you read the Bible, you're going to realize that God is a redeeming God. God is a God who changes lives. God is a God who gives another chance. God is a God who, at his heart, at the core of what his story is for you and for me and for every sinner that was ever born, is a redeeming story. It is a story of redemption that he wants for us. And in verse 2, when it tells Jonah to go cry to the city for their wickedness has come up before me, Jonah go, is supposed to go to Nineveh and Jonah is supposed to go tell them to repent because the judgment of God is coming. And God was giving this nation a chance to turn back towards God before his judgment will fall. And let me tell you, God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. And let me tell you, when you read in the Bible, you understand that God has a limit. You read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and you know he had reached his limit. He rained down fire and brimstone. When you read about the flood and Noah, you realize God reached his limit. 
But yet, also, in that, we read how much God has a time to where He gives us a chance to repent. That his first desire is not just his holiness as he is holy, but yet he has, he has this grace and he has this mercy and he has this redemption that he wants for you and for me. And as we read the Bible, we realize he's a God who redeems. And Nineveh was full of children. They were full of families. And he said, go to Nineveh and cry out to them so my judgment won't fall. I want to see them repent. I want to give them another chance. Because I'm a God who redeems. I'm a God who gives another chance. And, and yet, as we preach that message, and as he goes to send Jonah, as we think about it, are we, does that not just blow you away? That we serve a God who gives another, another chance. That we serve a God who, at first, wants us to be redeemed. We serve a God of another chance. Yes, God is holy, and yes, God is righteous, and we must talk about if we, when we violate God, he must act. But the, and Nineveh was full of sin. They were, they were full of debauchery, but even in God's holiness, he was full of compassion. He was full of mercy. He was full of grace, and he called the city not for judgment, but for repentance, for another chance. And, and God is a God of salvation. I hope you realize that. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, uh, God is just up in heaven and he's desiring to pour a wrath out on my life. Everywhere I've went in my life, God has always been against me. Let me tell you, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God who redeems. The God of the Bible is a God who gives another chance. The God of the Bible is someone that's not an evil tyrant. He's not someone that wickedly punishes people for no reason. God is a good God. God is a redeeming God. God is a God of another chance. And yes, he is holy. And yes, he will punish sin. And yes, he will judge. But he is also love. And he also loves the sinner. And he is the God of salvation. Now, for us as Christians, we know as we live in this world, we see a darkness in this world we've never seen before. We see a wickedness, not just in our own country, but in our communities and other, other places. And many of us is asking, how long will God tarry? What is God doing? We, and some Christians even call out on God to judge our country, to judge the world. But 2 Peter 3, 9 says this. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What promise? That he will return to judge the earth. But the reason why he is slack, he says, uh, you may say he's slack, but God is long-suffering toward us. Because he is not willing that anyone should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. You see that? That's the God I serve. That's the God you serve. That's the God of the Bible. And yes, we may get on our holy high horse and want everyone to be judged, but God is a good God. And God is tarrying not for you and for me to enjoy our Christianity. He is tarrying for another soul to come know him that will not have the wrath of God on them, but will come to repentance and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Is that not a good God? That is a good God because I'm one of those people. If God would not have tarried, if God would have judged the world long before I even had a chance to come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, I would have been under judgment. But he tarried, and he loved me, and he cares for me. And the, our heart should not be one of condemnation, but it should be one of redemption. We love John 3.16. Most of us could probably quote John 3.16. But John 3.17 is just as good. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the, but that the world through him might be saved. Listen, if God is not condemning, how in the world do we have the right to condemn if we are a Christian and we are following after God, we should present a God not of one who is going to punish, but a God who is one of salvation and redemption. And your life and my life, God wants redemption. He wants you to be redeemed. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Listen, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I have sinned. Billy Graham has sinned. Any spiritual giant that you can think of has sinned. Every single one of us has missed the mark. And we were born into sin, and that sin separated us from God. And God has every right to judge us and send us away for eternity. But God demonstrated his love in, uh, toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You get that? 
Some of you think, I need to get better or be a better husband or be a better wife or become a better person before I come to God. God says, come as you are. You are a sinner that you need to be saved. And you call out on God and he will save your soul. He will save who you are and he will redeem you. And in our hearts, isn't it great to know we've been redeemed? And for us as Christians, for those who've called upon the name of Jesus Christ, man, we should, our hearts should explode. Redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. Redeemed, redeemed. His child I forever I am. And the, and the character of God is one of redemption. If you're here this morning and you've never been redeemed, what a great day to do it. Don't wait another day. No man has promised tomorrow. As you hear my voice, you have an opportunity. And the God of redemption is calling your name only surrender your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, come into my life and save me. And he'll do it. You know why I know he'll do it for you? Because he did it for me. If he did it for me, he'll do it for anyone. And Jonah had this message. And Jonah had the call of God. And Jonah knew the character of God. Point number three, Jonah running from God. Now, I know this is probably the most famous of all Jonah's points because Jonah does run from God. And I used to hate preachers that would do that because it would make me so thirsty. But, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit sick. If you don't have a bottle of water, you can go get one out there, by the way. But, uh, anyways, Jonah running from God. Look at verse 3. This is the one we read. Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, to flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Oh, Jonah. But Jonah arose to flee from the presence of the Lord. God calls and Jonah runs. You know, Jonah says here he tries to flee from the presence of the Lord. But let me ask you a question. And a question that Jonah is going to answer and a question we're going to answer. Can you really run from God? Can you really get to a point to where you are never in the presence of the Lord? David learned this in the psalm, Psalm 139, 7 and 8. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? He said, if I ascend to the highest of heavens, you are there. And if I ascend to make my bed in the lowest parts of hell, you are there. We can't run from God. We may think we can run from God. And the temptation is to run from God. But you never really get away from God. And the bottom line is you're not going to be able to run far enough or fast enough to get away from God. And Jonah decided to try it. He decided to run. And listen, when we run from God, there's only one way we can go. Down. Two times you hear it says he went down to Joppa and he went down to the, to the presence. When we run from God, we always go down. Listen, as a Christian, when we decide not to pursue a relationship with God, we always go down. And here he went down. It says he found a ship to take him to Tarshish. How, how convenient. Listen, when you run from God, the devil is more than happy to be your chauffeur. He was there with a ship to take him to where he wanted to go. And let me tell you, as a Christian, the devil is never more accommodating than when you run from God. He has a ship. He has a person. He has a plan. He has something right there for you, waiting for you. And it says that he paid the fare. Listen, when we run from God, not only can we never get away from him, not only will the devil be accommodated, but there's always a price to pay when we run from God. There's always a price to pay. And when we run from God, we, we can't do it without it costing us. And you say, why, Jonah? Why did you run? Why do you think that we, you could get away from God? And Jonah, his specific reason, we find in chapter 4. Chapter 4, Jonah begins to pour his heart out from God. And we find out the reason why Jonah ran. Now, the reason why Jonah runs is probably different than the reason you're going to run from God or I run from God. But the reason why Jonah ran from God is it says in verse 2 of chapter 4, he said, I prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, 
was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Meaning that when he was there and God called him, he says, Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And you might say, well, that seems strange. Jonah ran from God because he said he was a loving and abundant and loving kindness and one who relents. <laughs> That's right. Jonah ran from God because he wasn't totally and completely surrendered to God. He knew that God was a God who redeems. He knew he was a God who was going to give, the, give this nation of Nineveh another chance. And Jonah, as I told you in the historical background of Jonah, his people was being persecuted. His family was persecuted. And, and as they were persecuted, some of them who persecuted them were the Ninevites. And so Jonah had a personal problem with the Ninevites. He had unforgiveness in his heart, and he had this pain from them harming him and his family. And rather than doing what God called him to do, Jonah said, I'm not doing it because I don't want to do it. And the reason why I don't want to do it is because God's going to do something that I don't want God to do. Does that sound familiar? We get to a point in our life to where we put God in our box. I talked a little bit about this last week. God, as long as you do what I tell you to do, I'm completely committed to you. But if you're going to do something outside of my box, and you're going to be God and do what you want to do, i got a problem with that. i got a problem with that because I like my job, and I don't want to sacrifice my job to move to go be a missionary or to serve the Lord. God, I like my time. I like my time, so if you're going to call me to serve the Lord and it's going to cost me in my schedule, I like my schedule, God. And I'm going to put you in my box. And I'm going to tell you, as long as you do what I tell you to do on my time frame and what I want to do, I'm fine with that. But God, if you're going to do something that's not in my box, I'm not going to let you be God. I'm going to be God. And Jonah says, I'm going to be God, and so he decided to run. And for us, the root of the whole series, this is where the rubber really meets the road. The question Jonah answered, and he said no. When Jonah was faced with the reality, if God was God, and he was completely and totally surrendered to him, it was a no. Jonah said, no, I'm running. And for us, in this series, this is the, this is the question. This is where it really hits home. If we put God in a box... And we only allow God to do what we want to do. Are we really completely and totally surrendered to him? And, and Jonah learns this lesson. And for us, it's a question we must learn. And as we dig a little deeper here and we look at Jonah and we look to see how he didn't want the message of repentance. He didn't want the Ninevites to come to know the Lord. Sometimes we get harsh like that as well, don't we? And, you know, I told you, living in this world, and I told you, having a lot of time when I was sick to watch the news and to listen to people talk and to listen to people who are in, 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 in your life. I must say that when I was there in the hospital, I didn't care who walked through those doors. I didn't care what color they were. I didn't care what preference they were. I didn't care what side of town they lived on. I don't care how they got to that hospital. When they walked through that door, I knew they were there to help me because I couldn't help myself. I knew that they were there from the compassion and mercy of God to help restore me. And when I looked at them, I didn't care if they were Republican or Democrat. I didn't care if they were from the west side, best side, by the way, all right? <laughs> I didn't care if they were from the south side. I didn't care if they were from St. John's County or they were from the north side. I didn't care. And listen, it, it was a wake-up call for me. And for Jonah, it's a wake-up call for him. And for us, it's a wake-up call. Are we more worried about our personal preferences than we are pursuing people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you, if we look through our social media, if we look through our conversations, if we could have a screen and just roll through them of what, what we talked about this week and what we posted this week, would people know more about you politically or socially or 
more of entertainment or more worldly things about you than they do about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jonah got to the point where he cared more about who he was and his family was and his country was more than he cared about pursuing them with the message of God. And for us as a church, for us as a community, for us as a body of believers, have we become so stuck on what our preferences are that we're not willing to pursue people who don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't vote like us? Are we rather judge them rather than to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ? Listen, I can convince you to vote a certain way. I can convince you to like things that I like. I can convince you to do things that I do. But the most important thing I could do for you is to share the gospel with you. Listen, that's what really matters. I'm going to tell you, when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you die and you're going to stand before him, he's not going to ask you those things. He's going to ask you, do you have a relationship with me? Have you surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ? That's what matters. And for us as Christians, like Jonah, listen, we can have preferences and we can chat and we can talk about them. That's great. I love to talk about those things. I love to talk about my opinions. I have a lot of opinions, but you don't see me preach my opinions. You don't see me preach opinions because opinions come and go. And opinions are like armpits. Everybody has two of them. And sometimes they stink, right? It's the truth. But listen, if I took someone's opinions and hated them personally so much so that I wasn't willing to share the gospel with them, that's wrong. If, if I got so judgmental and so, so condemning of a group of people that I'm not willing to sh even break my heart to pray for them, Something's wrong. If someone in your family member has come to the point that you would rather wish the judgment of God upon them rather than engaging them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's wrong. And that's where Jonah was. Jonah said, I don't care, God, what you're going to do. I just want them to be put in hell. I want them to be judged. But I knew, I know you're a good God. And you know, this reminds me, isn't it so great that we serve a God that is so good? Listen, you guys would be in trouble if I was God, right? You would be in trouble if God, Jonah was God. We all would be in trouble if you were God, right? Because we, we're not good. We don't have the heart of God. We don't have the compassion of God. And, and Jonah wanted to be God, and Jonah wanted judgment, but God wanted uh, redemption. And so Jonah said, because I knew you were a great God and a God who was going to give them another chance, I ran. I ran because I knew you were going to give them another chance. And for us, when God calls us, do we run or do we surrender? Listen, the, the choice that we must make, just like Jonah, we must surrender. Because when we run, it only goes down. And it only costs you and me. If I could have testimonies of people stand up here, they will tell you that when they ran from God, it cost them a marriage. When they ran from God, it cost them relationships with their kids. When they ran from God, it cost them their testimony at their work. When they ran from God, it cost them the ability to share the gospel with their grandkids or with those in their family. And listen, when we run from God, we go downhill. Not only do we go downhill, but it costs us. We have to pay the price. This little phrase I've used many times. And I don't know, even know who said it, but many preachers say it, and it's such a truthful saying. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Listen, when we run from God, it costs us. And many times people say, well, why are you so strict? Why are you such a teetotaler on things? Because you don't even want to play around with those things. You want to know how not to get on drugs? Don't ever do drugs. Don't even give the devil a foothold. You want to know how not to be a pervert? Don't even mess around fornication or adultery. If you want to know how to never lose your family or your marriage, don't flirt with other people of the opposite sex. Listen, I'm going to tell you, if you're struggling in your marriage, the devil's going to have somebody at your work say, Oh, come tell me all about it. I'm a listening ear. I want to hear. I want to help. That's, that's the wrong road to go down. Listen, when you go down that road, it's only going to end one way. And it's happened time after time and a time. And listen, for us as Christians, we can't afford to run from God. I told you, our time is short. Not just because I'm getting older, right? I was thinking this month, 
at the end of this month, I'll have a 19-year-old boy, an eight, wait, a 19-year-old man, I'm sorry. I will have a 19-year-old man, a 17-year-old boy, and a 12-year-old girl. I was thinking the other day, I was like, man, their parents are old. <laughs> I am their parents. I'm old, right? Uh, man. You know, you start these stories and you say, yeah, 10 years ago when I was in high, 20 years ago when I, no, 25 years ago when I was in high school, right? You, I mean, time's so fast, not only for us, but just in this world. Time is coming short, and we can't be messing around as Christians. we got a job to do. God has called us to do something, and in your home, your family, your neighborhood, God has called us to share the, G- the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we don't have time to run from God. And if you're here this morning, you're running from God, you got to stop. If your heart is hard and you're thinking of running from God, stop this morning. If you're in your marriage and you feel like giving up, stop it. Fight for your marriage. It's worth it. Fight for your kids. It's worth it. Don't send your kids off to other families to let them raise. Don't send your kid off to school to think that they're going to teach them the things of God. No, you take the time to do it. You answer the call. You don't run from God. You, you stand up and don't run from God. Let us have a heart of compassion. And if we are hard-hearted and we are judgmental, ask God to take your heart of stone out and put a heart of compassion and a heart of, of flesh in your soul. And as we come to our condition before, as we look to these pe- as people around us, as we look to their condition as lost and, and, and needing God, that's the way we were. Every one of us, when we come to God, we didn't earn it. You don't deserve to be saved. No one has. We are just sinners saved by grace. I love what one preacher said. Evangelism is telling another beggar where to find bread. That's what we are. That's what you are. And for me and for you, just like Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace that we have been saved, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And if it was the gift of God for us, why wouldn't we want it for other people? Why wouldn't we want it for the person next door? Why would we not want it for our work, per person in our workplace? Why would we not want it for the person that we come in contact with? And so the answer, as I said, to the question this morning is up to you. Am I totally and completely surrendered to God? Or do you have God in a box? If you have God in a box, you're going to run just like Jonah as soon as he does something you don't want him to do. And I said last week, and I say it this week, God never takes second place. He never does. He's God for a reason. And he's number one. And we may put him second place, but he's never going to settle for second place in our lives. He wants first place. And if we put God in our box, God is going to put us through the process, and we're going to learn what happens when we run from God. Jonah gets swallowed by, up by a fish. And in our lives, we have other things that God's going to do to us. But for this morning... Ask yourself, am I totally and completely surrendered to God? Are you going to run from God? Or are you running from God? If you are, it's not worth it. It's far better for this morning for you to come to God and say, I surrender all. Here I am, God. Totally and completely surrendered to you. Let's pray together this morning.